Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore the mind, nature, and the paranormal. With me is Dr. Stephen Browdy, who is the past chairman of the philosophy department of the University of Maryland and a past president of the Parapsychological Association. Steve is the author of numerous books, including most recently, Crimes of Reason, The Gold Leaf Lady, Immortal Remains, The Limits of Influence, and ESP and Psychokinesis. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, you're a rare person in the sense that you've had a mainstream academic career, and, and pretty much throughout your whole career, you've been quite open about your interest in the paranormal. After getting tenure, anyway, yes. Uh huh. Did you feel a necessity to keep it quiet initially? Well, no. The fact is, it wasn't until I got tenure that I remembered an exceptional incident that happened to me back in graduate school, which was watching my table rise in the air for about three hours in broad daylight. And then I realized if I was an honest scholar and philosopher, I needed to come to grips with this. Uh -huh. So I just played it straight until that time. I, I see. You more or less suppressed the memory until... I really put it out of mind. I knew at the mm -hmm. time, graduate school, when this happened, that I couldn't really discuss this with my mentors. Mm -hmm. So I, I literally put it out of mind. Well, and that strategy, whether conscious or subconscious, worked for you. Uh, it did. I'm not sure I would have gotten tenure had I expressed an interest in the paranormal before that. Mm -hmm. But having uh, achieved a level of recognition in your profession and tenure and in, in even chairmanship of, of your department, at that point you felt uh, comfortable engaging publicly in uh, paranormal research. <laughs> I'm not sure I ever felt comfortable doing it. Okay. I mean, I was incredibly naive at the beginning of my academic career. I actually thought that academics and especially philosophers and scientists would be committed to discovering the truth. And to show you how naive I was, I even thought that they would be happy to learn that they had been mistaken so long as making that discovery brought them closer to the truth. Mm -hmm. Since then, I haven't found too many people who fit that idealized profile. Well, my experience is that just about everybody I know engaged in research in any area of the paranormal, and I think some adjacent areas that are really normal but sort of borderline, mm -hmm. Everyone has a war story uh, about uh, having to deal with uh, unreasonable uh, criticism, very emotional uh, criticism, and uh, not just criticism, because I think any scholar can deal with criticism, but actual threats to one's career. It got in the way of my promotion to full professor. It didn't block it entirely, but it retarded it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only real threat to my career. I've experienced a great deal of hostility and really stupid, contemptible behavior from other people in, in the academic community. Mm -hmm. I don't regret any of that in retrospect because I think I now have a, a clearer picture of who my colleagues are. And some people whom I expected to be open and reasonable surprised me by their rigidity. And on the other hand, some people whom I expected to be inflexible surprised me with their open-mindedness. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for the, uh, uh, the war stories in that sense. Well, as a philosopher, you've had occasion to try and analyze the arguments used by the various skeptics and, and debunkers. And I'm sure these arguments fall into various categories. Some are legitimate methodological criticisms, but many of them are they seem to be emotionally based and in, 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 in a way well beyond the uh, level of normal academic discourse. One of the striking things I feel I've noticed is that academics who are opposed to psi research in general often resort to sleazy or clearly defective dialectical tactics whose flaws they'd be quick to recognize if the arguments had been directed against them. Mm -hmm. For example, straw man arguments, generalizing from the weakest cases. I see that all the time in parapsychology. 
Uh, one clear example would be Trevor Hall, who wrote a book about the medium D.D. Hume. Mm -hmm. His book on D.D. Hume spends about a quarter of the entire book discussing one of the most poorly documented cases in Hume's entire career, a levitation outside the window of Ashley House, or an mm -hmm. alleged levitation. This is in the 19th century. Yes, mm -hmm. right. It's a case that is absolutely immaterial to evaluating the mediumship of Hume altogether. And while Hall obsesses about that case, he never discusses the strongest pieces of evidence. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me in parapsychology, it's precisely the strongest pieces of evidence that matter, the ones that are hardest yeah. to explain away. Well, and what puzzles me is that many skeptics who are clearly not familiar with all the literature in parapsychology and related fields are, are very quick to use this phrase. I've heard it over and over again. There is not a shred <laughs> of evidence. They love that word, shred. Not a shred. <laughs> it's true. And fortunately, it's very easy to show if you have the right kind of public forum that these people are just posturing and bluffing. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask them to demonstrate their command of the evidence, they can't do it. And I've had the pleasure of doing that on any number of occasions. But mm -hmm. it's very easy to make such people look like fools. Well, it's very difficult then for people to pursue research in these areas. It's as if there are social pressures not to inquire at all. Yes. Um, I used to find that my students uh, who were majoring in psychology were being threatened by their mentors in the psychology department not to take my seminar, my upper level seminar in philosophy and parapsychology. They were being threatened with various kinds of reprisals. And why, why, why go that far? That's hard to analyze. Mm -hmm. I think in the case of psychologists who seem to be more militant about this than, say, people in physics, mm -hmm. it may be because psychology is uh, already being impugned as being a soft science or not as tough or legitimate a science as physics and chemistry and some other physical sciences. Mm -hmm. So psychologists may be on the defensive already. Well, it's as if the the very notion that there might be anything at all to extrasensory perception, telepathy, psychokinesis is enormously threatening to uh, some people, to their worldview. It is, and I think it's really easy to show in connection with psychokinesis or PK. Think of it this way. Yeah. If somebody can move a matchstick, a millimeter by thought alone, mm -hmm. it's a very small step conceptually from doing that to making somebody drop dead by thought alone. Mm -hmm. So the existence of any psychokinesis at all forces us to take seriously a kind of magical worldview, which most of us associate, usually condescendingly, only with so-called primitive cultures. Right. It's a worldview according to which we might have to take seriously um, such unsavory consequences as um, people having accidents. Uh, or the things that we think of as the evil eye or hexing. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are parts of the world, usually un undeveloped countries, where that sort of thing goes down rather smoothly. But in most developed countries, it causes just mm -hmm. the opposite reaction. Well, now I think a lot of parapsychologists would say, oh, you're, you're going overboard. The phenomenon isn't that. We're not going back to an era of witchcraft persecution. But you seem to be suggesting we have to look seriously at uh, the way you know, people thought about these things two or three hundred years ago. I think we do. I think it's not so, oh, while it may be correct to think that we're, if we take this phenom these phenomena seriously, that we're reverting to a kind of magical worldview. Mm -hmm. I th actually think that's right, mm -hmm. but I'm not alarmed by that. I mean, that, that may be the correct view. Uh, but what Im interests me is that there are people who are willing to consider positive applications of things like PK and healing or prayer for world peace, mm -hmm. but refuse to pay attention to their own inconsistencies because they fail suddenly to see what I think they would recognize in other contexts, that no force can be used exclusively for the good. So if you're willing to take the possibility of psychic healing seriously, you have to take seriously, I think, the possibility of uh, psychic damage to somebody. Well, if these emotional skeptics are basically frightened of a world in which uh, psychokinesis and telepathy existed on a regular basis, uh, then perhaps their uh, overly emotional reactions, their attempt to shut down all inquiry is justified. 
Well, I think it may be an overreaction in this sense. Even if it's possible for thoughts to kill, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, it hardly follows that they will just because we have a, a negative thought. I think we need to back up for a second. Yeah. One of the pervasive mysteries in parapsychological research, and one of the major problems still at this stage in uh, parapsychological r research history, is that we haven't a clue what sort of thing we're trying to study. It's not as if we have a clear picture of the so-called natural history of psi phenomena. Right. We don't know what it's doing in real life. Presumably it has some sort of role outside of the context in which parapsychologists set out to look for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, psi phenomena didn't start at the point when research began. These phenomena have been brought into the lab because people were reporting spontaneous, ostensible right. psi events for millennia. Well, there's an ethno-historical tradition that yes. includes witchcraft, shamanism, yoga, uh, all sorts of cultural approaches to the paranormal, but w w very often it does involve the, the possibility of harmful consequences. Absolutely. But let's just suppose for the, as a thought experiment, yeah. that psi events can be triggered unconsciously. Okay. Um, and in fact, there's even evidence, if you want to look at the laboratory evidence, for supporting that. But quite apart from that, if it's possible for people to be influencing the world psychically, mm -hmm. then, and maybe even animals influencing mm -hmm. the world psychically, then imagine just how enormously complex this underlying causal network has to be um, that we're positing here. Mm -hmm. It may be that all of us, all or much of the time, are putting out our psychic feelers into the world, yeah. trying to influence things mm -hmm. unconsciously or consciously. Now, if every living creature or just every living human is trying to do that, it might seem to be miraculous that any of our psychic intentions actually succeeds. It looks as though they would have to navigate this enormously complex causal nexus mm -hmm. just to hit their target. And I puzzle often over the question of whether a favorable cultural attitude actually is psi conducive, that more experiences occur to people when the culture supports it. It may well be true. Mm -hmm. And unless you're willing to look at the natural history of psi and try to figure these things out, um, you'll never have a handle on that. Mm -hmm. And until you have a handle on that, it seems almost ludicrously premature to try to bring psi events into the lab because we have no idea what we're trying to study. Well, laboratory research in parapsychology dates back at least to the 1940s, right. 1930s. You can even find earlier examples. One, one might say it's the dominant mode of uh, parapsychology yeah, inquiry right now is the experimental method and parapsychologists are also very proud that they're using the, the same methods as other people in the behavioral sciences, even in uh, to some degree the same methods used in medicine and in physics. Well, yes, I think that's part of a uh, pervasive attempt among parapsychologists to demonstrate that they're just doing regular science. Mm -hmm. But the nasty truth of the matter may be that to really do proper research in parapsychology, you have to adopt a different kind of method because mm -hmm. we're dealing with a phenomenon which, if it exists, can apparently subvert any controls that we could conceivably impose. Yeah. Again, if you look at a PK or psychokinesis experiment, how do you make sure, for example, that uh, it's only the official subject who's being tested for PK, that's demonstrating PK. It's not as if we can go through with a PK meter and look for lines of force prior to the events actually happening. Mm -hmm. So for all we know, the actual results we obtain might be due to the official subject or to the experimenter or to a casual onlooker or to somebody on a mountaintop in Tibet. There's my, no way to know. My understanding is that there are no known barriers no known ways to always block ESP, even though there are some statistical trends. Right. Yet, parapsychological researchers often act as though all of those connected with a psi experiment are going to adhere to this idiotic gentleman's agreement where only the official subject will use only the psi ability being tested for, and only when the experimenter's gun goes off, you know, at the right appointed time and that no one else even remotely connected with the experiment will use whatever psychic mm -hmm. abilities they might have to muddy the evidential waters. Yeah. Well, your argument would suggest that if 
psychic abilities, or as parapsychologists say, psi abilities are real, these methodological problems will pertain not only to parapsychology, but really to every other behavioral science. And I think that might be one of the reasons why there is so much resistance in the regular science community against taking parapsychological research seriously. I think many <clears throat> scientists intuit that if we allow psi into our picture of the world, then all bets are off and all hell could break loose because then, I mean, it's not just parapsychologists who have an emotional investment in the outcome of their experiments. And if that can be psi-conducive, and if parapsychologists can influence their machines mm -hmm. psychokinetically, then who knows how the uh, evidence in science mm -hmm. has been corrupted by similar phenomena. Yeah. Well, you're arguing for a more naturalistic uh, approach, which is, to my understanding, how the field really began 150 years ago or so. Uh, case study research was the dominant mode, and uh, as best I can uh, figure out the methodology of the case study, it's not so different from preparing uh, evidence to present in a courtroom. You interview witnesses, you try to document as carefully as you can what actually occurred, and, and then you reconstruct what happened uh, looking for possible alternative explanations at each point along the way. Well, that's certainly one thing we can do. Mm -hmm. I don't even think we have to eschew experiments entirely mm -hmm. if we keep them out of the lab. I mean, there have been experiments on physical mediums, for example, yeah. that have been very carefully done. It's just that they've been done in contexts that are more congenial to the subject than uh, conditions in a normal laboratory would be. Mm -hmm. Now, lest our uh, viewers think of you as some sort of a gullible philosopher who's willing to swallow all of this paranormal stuff hook, line, and sinker to the point of reverting back to, to, to some of the thinking of hundreds of years ago when, when witches were burned at the stake, I know you're very critical of uh, certain approaches in parapsychology, for example, the the whole question of uh, survival after death. Uh, from your point of view, the evidence is not where many of the proponents uh, say it is. No, I think the case for postmortem survival is not nearly as strong as many of the uh, survivalists uh, would argue. Mm -hmm. But I think the main challenges come from two sources. First of all, there are a number of extraordinary uh, capacities of living human beings that need to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, there we would look at cases of savantism, prodigies, dissociation, latent capacities, for example. Mm -hmm. That might account for many of the phenomena that we see in uh, ostensible survival cases. The biggest challenge, though, comes from positing psi phenomena uh, among the living, telepathy or clairvoyance, for example, among mediums. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, no matter what evidence I might come up with that seems to argue in favor of uh, the survival, like, like there's a case on record that's gotten a lot of attention where it seemed as if a long deceased chess master was uh, manifesting through a spirit medium and actually played a game of chess with a living chess master. The game was subsequently analyzed by a, a parapsychologist who himself was a chess master and said this is, uh, the, the game reflects unique talents that, that couldn't have been uh, acquired simply through telepathy. The problem is that telepathy is required even to explain how the survivalist scenario works, mm -hmm. because you need to explain uh, how the medium uh, and the deceased chess player are communicating, which moves to do. You also have to posit clairvoyance on the part of either the uh, either clairvoyance on the part of the surviving chess player to know what the state of play is, mm -hmm. or telepathy with the medium to know what the state of play is. So no matter where you turn, you've got psi phenomena. You've either yeah. got survi um, survivalist psi, psi on the part of the deceased or on the part of the medium, mm -hmm. or living agent psi on the part of the medium. I recall reading an issue of the Smithsonian Institute magazine from 1903, <laughs> summarizing all the evidence for survival in that era. And uh, what they wrote back then, uh, over 110 years ago, was that uh, uh, while the evidence doesn't yet force us to conclude that the human personality survives bodily death, for sure uh, it does establish the existence of telepathy. 
or clairvoyance. And uh, under the impression, we haven't advanced much since then. No, I don't think we have. And I think some of the methodological issues to which I referred earlier mm -hmm. um, indicate why. I mean, just as it's difficult to control for PK, it's difficult to know um, how to do a double-blind experiment in parapsychology. I mean, the only f f sources of information you can actually block are normal sources of information. Right. And uh, one has to assume, I suppose, that human beings uh, operate primarily on, on the normal information channels and maybe occasionally you're at a subconscious level on uh, what we might think of as psychic channels of information. You might think it's occasional, but I don't think we even know that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's part of what I was indicating earlier when I yeah. said we don't know the natural history of psi. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as if our ESP experiences have to announce themselves by being dramatic or radically discontinuous with our other thoughts. It doesn't have to be a kind of internal analog to a flourish of trumpets announcing when an ESP event is going to occur. Right. So for all we know, we could be interacting telepathically with the mind of strangers. I mean, you know, most people have um, errant thoughts of one kind mm -hmm. or another. And we tend to suppose that we're just cranking them up ourselves. Mm -hmm. But we have no way of really being sure where they're coming from. No, we don't, and, and we have thousands of them every day. Right. So, I mean, we have to navigate our own thoughts. It's, it's very tricky. Uh, and then when you add to that the uh, complexities of uh, modern psychoanalysis, for example, where Freud argued very cogently that we don't even want to know what's in our own subconscious mind, right. let alone have other people uh, have access to that. Right, so psychodynamically the cases uh, are, are very complex, parapsychologically the cases are very complex, and most researchers are operating at a, a very superficial level, it mm -hmm. seems to me. Now one of your uh, areas of specialty is um, multiple uh, identity disorder, multiple personality Associative identity uh, disorder. Associative dis identity disorder. Uh, can you describe that and explain how it might or might not be related to the paranormal? Well, in cases of what used to be called multiple personality disorder, now dissociative identity disorder, um, people exhibit apparently relatively autonomous but quite distinct uh, personality states mm -hmm. or identity states, sometimes with radically different physiological counterparts to them. So one alter identity might be nearsighted uh, or resistant to certain drugs and another one would not. I've even heard that the colors of the eyes can change. Uh, yes, eyeglass mm -hmm. prescriptions, colors of eyes can change, uh, facial features can change, musculature can mm -hmm. change. It might argue that, the, you know, for the possession of different spirits. Well, the reason this bears on survival research mm -hmm. is that what you see in many cases of DID or MPD looks very much like what you see in certain cases of mediumship. Yes. So I think a really clear-headed appraisal of the evidence for survival requires a deeper understanding of dissociative phenomena than you'll find among most of the people writing on survival. Well, even among psychologists, I gather it's controversial. Well, yes. Uh, it's controversial in the same way that psi phenomena are controversial, and the same sorts of sleazy dialectical tactics deployed against association researchers are virtually identical to those um, deployed against parapsychologists. Well, and I wouldn't be surprised that some of those sleazy tactics occur in, in many other areas of science where people get involved in heated debates. But oh yes, I mean intellectual dishonesty <laughs> isn't confined to uh, dissociative research yeah. or parapsychological research. But another related area in psychology is hypnosis. Uh, yes, and an example of the kind of um, bad argumentation uh, that I've been pointing to is Nicholas Spanos, for example, waged a, a prominent campaign against the reality of hypnosis as an altered state distinct from engaged ro role playing or social compliance. Mm -hmm. But he generalized from the weakest pieces of evidence. He focused on hypnotic phenomena that are relatively easy to simulate uh, to please a, a hypnotherapist or hypnotist mm -hmm. and completely ignored the cases that matter. For example, Esdale in the 19th century in India was performing radical surgery, removal of great toenails by the roots, limb amputation, removal of 100-pound scrotal tumors. Yes, you heard that right. Mm -hmm. um, 
And subjects who were undergoing these procedures showed no reaction whatever, no s sign of pain. Now, if that's not a paradigmatic altered state, I don't know yeah. what it is. Well, the, the intri intriguing thing to me about Esdale's surgeries and hypnosis is, is there's kind of a parallel in psychical research where in the 19th century you had all of these incredible mediumistic phenomenon, table levitations, as ectoplasmic right. spirit materializations that, that don't seem to occur today. And some people seem to think, well, if they're not happening presently, maybe uh, they never really happened at all then. Well, I'm not sure they're not happening <clears throat> presently, but I think they have been driven somewhat underground. There are yeah. still f physical mediums around today. Um, and there's still plenty of interesting hypnotic work being done, even experimental work. There were some recent studies on hypnotic uh, dentistry mm -hmm. where hemophiliac dental patients, there I think it was something like 250 uh, surgical procedures on hemophiliac dental patients under hypnosis and no bleeding. Oh, okay, very interesting. Well, what you're pointing out, uh, Stephen, is is that the human mind is a vast frontier, and uh, we still know so very little. Couldn't agree it. more. Stephen Browdy, it's been a pleasure having you with me. Thank you very much. Steve. I look forward to uh, more interviews with you. Me too. Thanks very much. And thank you for being with us. <laughs>